at Miller Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The New York Mets play the Milwaukee Brewers. Tuesday Night Baseball is presented by Verizon. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Buick. Visit TristateBuick.com and experience the new Buick for yourself. By Pepsi, the official soft drink of Major League Baseball. By Wise Snacks. Go to windupandwin.com now for your chance to win Wise Snacks, Mets experiences, and other amazing prizes. By your Mercedes-Benz Tri-State dealers on the web at mbusa.com. And by Geico, the number one insurer in the New York market. Well, the Mets got a day off yesterday. They are searching for runs. They're sailing for runs. They're skying for runs. They may even ask the Fonz for runs here in Milwaukee as the Mets continue their road trip by the shores of Lake Michigan. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to Miller Park. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling with you tonight as the Mets open a three-game series against the Brewers. Mets have lost five straight games on this road trip, and the news only gets worse. They got Travis Darno back from the disabled list two weeks ago. He played eight games coming back from a broken finger. Now Darno is right back on the disabled list with a sprained left elbow. You know, Gary, you just almost feel awful for this kid because it just seems like he plays so hard. When you think about Travis Darno, probably the best everyday player the Mets have and just this odd play at home where he tried to make a great play and a throw up the line A.J. Brzezinski almost ripped his arm off and the result is is the sprain of that left elbow and just horrible with the with the problems the Mets are having trying to score runs they have their best hitter out of the lineup. Johnny Manel has been called up from AAA to take Darno's spot on the roster Kevin Plewecki will get the bulk of the playing time again in his absence. So here the Mets are. Their position players are not hitting. They're not fielding particularly well. The starting pitching has really held up its end. And so far, the starters have said all the right things in terms of not pointing fingers. But how does that evolve in a clubhouse when you've got one area of the team that's performing well and others that aren't? You know, that's a great question. I think it's very, very important that the uh, part of the team, the starting pitching, that has been great, they have to continue to say the things that they've been saying. They've got to stay together as a unit this is when you see if you're a team and you have team unity is that no one starts pointing fingers at some other part of the team John Neese will be on the mound for the Mets tonight Neese has kind of turned his season around these last three starts well you know Jonathan hasn't won since May 9th but when you look at this last three starts he's been able to go a little deeper in games he's using his curveball a little more and he's having a little more success and he's going to go up against Mike Fires who has the same record three and seven he has struggled also, so maybe it is the night for the Mets to break out of that hitting slump. The Brewers languishing at the bottom of the National League Central. Their hitting is about the same as the Mets. Mets have pitched much better. The tailgaters are out at Miller Park on a gorgeous evening in Wisconsin. Come on back. Mets and Brewers, all the action coming your way on SNY.
351 at your Toyota dealer. Toyota, let's go places. By City, proud partner of the New York Mets. And by State Farm, today's State Farm agent of the game is John Garfinkel of Brooklyn. Contact John at johngarfinkel.com. The first post-game concert of the season is this, is this Saturday after the Mets play the Reds at 4.10 p.m. It features the Steve Miller Band, and it's all presented by Pepsi, and it's all included in the price of your ticket. Purchase tickets online at Mets.com slash concerts. Road Ahead presented by Buick. Three-game series here in Milwaukee. Night game tomorrow, day game Thursday. Then the Mets are back home. Their first meeting of the year with the Cincinnati Reds over the weekend. They'll face Johnny Cueto on Friday night. Then the Cubs come in for their only visit to City Field before the Mets take their last trip before the All-Star break to Los Angeles and San Francisco. It's the Mets and Brewers at Miller Park. Delightfully cool. Not quite Atlanta-ish. Jonathan Nice on the mound for the Mets. First pitch is coming up. of the season for a Brewers starting staff that is bottom of the National League in ERA. Here's your Geico Mets starting lineup tonight. Kevin Pluecki getting the start behind the plate with Travis Darno newly on the disabled list. Ruben Tejada moves up to the number two spot in the batting order and that's the unit the Mets will send out looking to get some offense generated against Mike Fires, whom they haven't faced as a starter since 2012. Well you can see his Toyota numbers very interesting has the high ERA a bad losing record but he strikes out a lot of hitters 82 strikeouts and only 74 innings of work. And Lexus defense Coors Light defense Parado Parra left field Carlos Gomez Ryan Braun in the outfield Gomez been nursing an ailing hip Ramirez Segura Perez and Lind in the infield and Jonathan Lucroy's back behind the plate he was on the DL for a long time. Never Lexus and Coors Light in the same sentence. That's right. <laughs> Curtis Granderson leads off for New York. Curtis the last two days three for seven with a couple of walks. He's gotten on base the last two games. First pitch of the night by Fires. The fastball for a strike and we're underway. It'll be Granderson Tejada and Duda for the Mets in the opening inning. 
That's at a day off yesterday to refresh here in Milwaukee and they got refreshed by massive thunderstorms up and into Granderson one and one which I understand have worked their way to the New York metropolitan right. area today. Today we had a gorgeous day in Milwaukee temperature around 70 the roof is open it is a delightful night for baseball in Wisconsin that's ripped foul by Granderson that's one and two. Mike fires you see throwing 89 miles an hour and that's the the interesting thing about him he's a high strikeout guy who doesn't throw particularly hard but he does throw unusual in the sense that he throws straight over the top he's got a good breaking pitch and even better change up. Fires now 30 years old in his fifth year with the Brewers. And Granderson fouls back the fastball. Last year, Fires was something of a savior for the Brewers in the middle of the season. He came up in June and again in August, and he had a terrific stretch for them. As Craig Council, who took over as manager of the Brewers 25 games into the season, things have gone a little better for him than they did for Ron Renneke. And the curve ball in for a call third strike. There's that breaking ball Ronnie was talking about. He gets Granderson looking for the first out of the night. Throws straight over the top. It is a 12 to 6 curve ball and it catches Granderson looking. So one out and nobody on. And now Ruben Tejada. You can certainly make the argument that Tejada has been the Mets' hottest hitter over the last three weeks. Last 19 games, he's hitting 315. I think that's really good news for Tejada, but not for everybody else. <laughs> that's what I'm talking. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. That's been shut out twice already on this road trip. Most recently on Sunday when they dropped a one nothing decision to Atlanta and Julio Tehran. And Byers skips one in there for ball one. Well. When you watch Mike Fires pitch, if you're going to attend one of his starts, you might want to settle in for a while. <laughs> That's right. Because Fires throws 17.7 pitches per inning, which is among the leaders in most pitches per inning. And he's the second slowest worker of all pitchers in the National League behind, behind Kyle Kendrick of the Rockies. That's a bad combination. Boy, Kyle Kendrick has been hit awfully hard. As a member of the Colorado Rockies, hard for the defense. You mean that whole staying on your toes thing? Not exactly. The guys are on your heels. That's Rick Kranitz and Mike Guerrero. Kranitz has been the pitching coach here for five seasons. Lucas Duda waiting on deck. Now, Ramos Ramirez playing a step in at third against Tejada, who never bunts. And he pops one up on the infield. And Lind in the foul ground. Two out. You know, it's interesting, Gary, you're talking about fires taking all that time. Early in my career, I was a very methodical, slow worker, but I did not know it. And Mel Stottlemyre came up to me one time and said, Why don't you work quicker? I go, Am I working slow? He goes, Unbelievably slow. I said, Okay, I'll. Pick it up a notch. It was very easy to do. And when you did, did you find it, it, it hurt you in any way in terms of thinking out your pitches or your concentration? It just changed uh, everything as far as my ability to throw strikes. That was the key. The upping the tempo helped me throwing strikes. Lucas Duda takes up and away. But some guys now, especially if they've seen sports psychologists, there's like this whole list of things they kind of have to think about. Before they start their approach to the plate. Well, that was the whole Steve Traxel yeah. thing. He had to visualize every pitch before he threw it. And he'd stare ah. down at his he'd get up on the rubber and you'd yeah. think he was about to throw the pitch, and he'd stare down at his feet for, for three or four seconds, then look up and get his sign and start the whole process. And you know, we watched Mark Burley last week, who was the antithesis of all that. And you wonder for some of these slow workers whether they ever look at the guys who work fast and are successful and say, I'd like to be more like them. I, I think a lot of it is the way you pitch is kind of how your personality is. And I think for some guys, they're just slower. They process the pitch, part of pitching slower. Council, they've been 18 and 28 under his reign. Full shift on against Duda, as is the norm. Lucas hitting just 188 this month. And he hits one right at the shortstop, Segura. And he throws him out to end the inning. One, two, three inning for Mike Fires. John Beast takes the bound when we get back.
Rangers. Carlos Gomez back in the lineup. He's missed eight of the last 11 games with a hip injury, and he's hitting cleanup tonight, not leadoff where he had been working. So they moved Gene Segura up to the leadoff spot. Jonathan Lucroy and Segura were both out of the lineup when the Mets faced the Brewers in May. Well, you see the cheap numbers for Jonathan Neese, who got his first start in the major leagues, was here at Miller Park. Nearly seven years ago. Amazing, right? September 2nd, 2008. John Neese made his major league debut right here against the Brewers. Ricky Weeks was the first batter, and he hit the second pitch for a home run. Auspicious start. Segura takes a strike, and it's one and one. Segura was out with a broken finger when the Mets beat the Brewers two out of three at City Field. Hit 272 for the year, and he bounces one to third. Nice short hop picked by Tejada for the first down. What did you say before that after Jonathan came out of that game, the relief pitcher who took his place was Nelson Figueroa. There's Alexis Mets defense, Kadari Lagares, and Granderson in the outfield. Tejada who just made the play, Flores, Herrera, and Lucas Duda on the right side. Puecki will be doing most of the catching. So here's Jonathan Lucroy, the Brewers all star catcher who missed 38 games with a broken toe. Just now getting into form. And he takes ball one. Lucroy was a breakout player last year. He finished fourth in the MVP balloting. Hit 301, 13 home runs last year. Tremendous defense as well. He holds the record now for catchers and doubles. He had 51, I believe, last season. Ryan Braun waiting on deck. One very odd thing about this Milwaukee team, and they've struggled in almost all areas, but they are a right hand dominated power hitting team that has not hit lefties this year. They're hitting 216 as a team against left hand pitching, and you go up and down the lineup Luke Roy and Braun and Gomez and Ramirez, all these right hand hitters. Have really struggled against lefties. I was wrong about Luke Croy. 53 doubles he had last year. Up the ante. <laughs> you and I remember his first start here with Randy Wolf. Randy Wolf on the mound, and Randy Wolf almost was so perplexed with Luke Croy catching that he called him out, it seemed like, every pitch. Yeah, it's funny about things like that. Players who you get to see right at the Outset of their careers who turn into you know, star players. Yeah. Um, we mentioned it the last time we saw the Brewers, Ramos Ramirez, when he was 19 years old, starting out with the Pirates. I believe he started 0 for 24 <laughs> before he finally got a hit against the Mets. Job foul, and it's two and two to Lucroy. Well, that's the one thing that John has done better in his last three starts. He's kept the ball down much better than he did before, especially his sinking fastball. Before then, he had a tough time. Ten home runs given up. It's not like John to give up that many homers. Pitched well in Toronto that last start. His kryptonite was the number eight guy on the order, Kevin Pilar. Slow grounder. Tejada cuts in to get this one. And the quick toss gets Luke Roy for the second out. Well, just good footwork here. If you're the third baseman, you always want to get everything that you can get to. Because your movement is moving right towards the first baseman, makes it an easier throw. Nice to see Ruben moving well after he turned his ankle the other night. That play in third base. Chase Peterson kind of rolled over his ankle. So now Ryan Braun with two out and nobody on. The game that the Brewers won in the series at City Field, Braun had himself a field day with a couple of home runs. He's at 14 this year and usually swing at the first pitch. Here he hits a first pitch curveball to left center for a base hit. That's right on cue. <laughs> well, eight of his 14 home runs have been on the first pitch. A little rolling breaking ball by Jonathan Neese. That has been a pitch that he's going to have to get away from throwing. Just, you know, lobbying that curveball over the plate. So two on the runner aboard. Now Carlos Gomez. Gomez has had a little hip problem, which has been connected to a groin problem, and so he's been out of the lineup the last four games and eight of the last 11, but back in there today. And Gomez takes the cutter in the dirt for ball one. Today's game changer brought to you by T Mobile. 
Brian Braun always hits lefties right behind David Wright among active leaders. And we hope active in David Wright's case will become actually active soon. Soon. The Mets need you, David. 2 0 to Gomez, and he checks the swing and did not stop it in time. On Culpa with the call at first, 2 and 1. Gomez now 29 years old, two time All Star who started out his career with the Mets back in 07. Juan will sneak a stolen base every now and again, has seven this year. John does a very nice job controlling the running game. He does. It helps that he's left handed, but he definitely varies his move. He's got that quick move to the plate that he can use also. Pull toward the hole and pass to Diamond Flores. A base hit for Gomez. Ron pulls in at second, so back to back two out hits for Milwaukee. Well, the defense, you can see that Flores is playing him the pole. But if you've noticed Flores of late, he is playing almost four steps in from the grass. That makes it very difficult to have any range. Now, why do you think that is? Is that to make the throw a little easier? They're trying to make the throw easier for him because they don't feel like he has a strong enough arm. Like you see a guy like Simmons or uh, the great shortstops uh, in the league. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a hard. That's a hard balance to reach with a guy like Flores who doesn't have great range to begin with. Here's Adam Lind. And he takes a cutter outside. I think it's got to be a change for him depending on the hitter. Let's say you get Ramirez up there who doesn't run very well down the first base. He's got to play deeper on a hitter like that. Gomez has got a little more speed of course. There's a strike one on one. Lynn hitting at 276, 10 home runs. He's got 156 career home runs. Career high was 35. Let's see what he's done this year in two out RBI opportunities. And he bangs one up the middle for a base hit. Braun turns third, heads home. Lagares' throw will go to second. And the Brewers have the first inning run. Three straight two out hits. Adam Lynn drives in the run, and it's 1 0 Milwaukee. Well, this has really been the issue for Jonathan Neese this entire season. And I could even say maybe most of his career is that when he starts to give up hits, he gives them up in bunches. Three in a row now with two outs. And Ronnie Lagares is at the point now where he didn't even give a thought about throwing home. You know, the, the, the other night is uh, um, with LeVarnway running, other afternoon, I guess, night. Uh, that's a play he would have made every single time last year. So. You know, obviously his arm is just in such bad shape. He can't even attempt to throw. So here's Ramos Ramirez who has been the subject of much discussion involving whether the Mets might be interested in taking his contract on. He intends to retire at the end of this year although that's not necessarily a firm commitment. He's got good numbers against Nice in his career six for 19 with a couple of home runs. And John falls behind two and oh. Well, he is a high ball hitter. Let's see his career numbers. There are numbers that not a lot of people who don't follow the game closely would know that he's got 377 home runs, over 1,300 RBI. Three time All Star. And Nice promptly falls behind him 3 0 with the left hand batter Gerardo Parra on deck. Well, with left handed batter up next, expect Ramirez to think about swinging on this pitch. He likes the ball up, middle of the plate in. Gomez at second, Lind at first, and Ramirez right. takes a strike. Ramos Ramirez now 36 years old. As we mentioned, he came up when he was 19 with the Pirates, so he has had himself a long career. Fouls it away, 3 2. That's the pitch you got to stay away from there. You see him shaking his head. Two seasons with 25 more home runs. Seven with 100 or more RBI. Gomez and Lynn get set to run. 3 2 coming, and it's inside ball four, and the bases are loaded. That's a pretty good pitch there by John, just not caught correctly by Kevin Pawecki and Dan Worthen with an early visit out to his lefty. 
This is a pretty good pitch here. If he frames that a little better, I think he might get that for a called strike. But it just goes off his glove. Is that one where maybe the movement fooled him that he expected it not to move quite as much and he didn't turn his glove because of it? I think two, two things. That definitely the movement got him. But also I think he was trying so hard to hold that ball in the strike zone that he, that he didn't catch it right in the pocket. Sometimes these catchers get so good they can catch it right on the end of the glove to keep it in the strike zone. It's all part of the effort to frame pitches better and steal more strikes but sometimes it can cost you on the other end. So a huge moment early in this game for John Neese facing Gerardo Parra who actually although he's left handed has the best numbers against left hand pitching of all these Brewers. He's hitting 300 against lefties this year. Base is loaded two down and he takes a strike at the knees. Parra who came over from Arizona last summer has really been a bright spot for Milwaukee this year. Former Gold Glove outfielder. Hits one right at the second baseman and Herrera makes the play. And that retires the side. So he's able to limit the damage to one run. We go to the second, one nothing Milwaukee. Michael Kadire leads off the second inning for New York against Mike Fires, who has himself a 1 0 lead. Kadire just four hits in his last 27 at bats, hitting a 256 for the year. And he takes a fastball for a strike. A difficult year for Kadire, and it's only gotten more difficult as the team has slumped as a unit. Strikeouts are up, double plays are up, batting average is down. Well, I think when you signed Michael Kadire, you thought he'd be one of your ancillary parts of your offense. And he's become so important, and he hasn't been able to deliver so far. Well, you take him out of an environment at Coors Field, you don't expect those kinds of numbers. Right. But then you see what he does in spring training this year not only hitting for average, but hitting the ball to the ballpark regular, regularly. Yeah. And you just haven't seen that at all over the first two and a half months. Curveball bounce foul. Well, his career numbers are um, 270, 275. But I didn't think he'd strike out this much. I always just thought he was a better contact hitter. Yeah, you expect a higher on base percentage. Yeah. You expect fewer strikeouts. And of course, the double plays. He has 12 of those now, including the one that ended the game on Sunday. 1 2 from Fires. And he fouls it away. Remember, it was Mike Fires last year who hit. John Carlos Stanton in the face. 
So the numbers home and road for the Dyer with the Rockies. Was last year limited to just a handful of games because of injuries. Stanton hit his 26th tonight off yeah. Carlos Martinez. You know, it's funny watching Stanton early this season. There were a few pitches inside that he appeared to flinch on a little bit, but in total, it doesn't seem to have had any impact on. Him. I think the only thing that's impacted is he's struck out a little more, and his average is down, but continues just to blast it out of the park. Seventh pitch of the at bat to Kadire, and he goes down swinging on the fastball. Second strikeout for Mike Fire. It's interesting. It's like when he swings through these pitches that are right down the middle, you'll see Michael look back like he can't even believe he swung through it. Get to City Field this Sunday when the Mets take on the Reds at 110. The first 15,000 fans will receive a Lucas Duda growth chart. That's a lot of growth, courtesy of SNY. After the game, all kids 12 and under can run the bases in the Mr. Med Dash. For tickets, visit Mets.com slash Family Sundays. Wilmer Flores hooks one at the left field. Diving Parak goes off his glove. And Flores is aboard, and Parak quickly after it to hold Flores to a single. Right, Opara, two time gold glover, nearly made a spectacular play. Well, he makes a lot of spectacular plays. You can never count him out, but I think that Flores got enough topspin on that ball for it to dive just at the last second. Wilma Flores thought that Parra was going to make a catch at some point. Wilma, who doesn't have great speed, would have never been able to turn that into two. Parra did a great job yeah. to, to keep that ball from getting behind him after it hopped in front of his glove. So here's Juan Lagares with a runner aboard. Mets have their first hit of the night against Mike Fires. Lagares hitting 309 in June, 271 for the year. Fires takes forever to deliver the ball to the plate, but it really doesn't matter because Mets don't have any team speed. Mets and Brewers are tied for 12th in the National League in stolen bases. Which is a bit surprising because you know, the Brewers have got Carlos Gomez, who's got a history of stealing bases, Gene Segura, Ryan Braun. Scooter Jeanette, who hasn't had that kind of year. You thought he'd steal a few. Mets have scattered around their steals. Ligaris has five. He is the king of Mets base stealers. It's a long way from Reyes is 78. Driven to right center, but on comes Gomez to grab it. And that's the second out. So two out Flores at first, and now here's Kevin Plowecki. If you missed the news earlier, Travis Darno went on the disabled list today. And we're hoping that he'd only miss a day or two. Well, now it's a full blown disabled list, and it may well be more than two weeks for Travis. Diagnosed today with a sprained left elbow. He was feeling better Saturday, but then Sunday it really started to act up on him. And uh, yesterday had an MRI here in Milwaukee. And it was troubling enough that they sent him to New York where he saw Dr. Alchek today at the hospital for special surgery. And they diagnosed him with a sprain, which is a little bit ambiguous right. in terms of the severity, but doesn't sound all that promising in terms of a short term recovery. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to label a player as injury prone. Because so many things are circumstantial. I mean, the play that he hurt his elbow on was freaky. Um, right. Last year, he gets hit in the head by an overswing by uh, Soriano, and suffered some concussion. Yep. Um, you know, he got hit on the hand earlier this year, broke a bone. So I don't know. Does that make a player injury prone, or just make him unlucky? Uh, unlucky in regular life as a ball player, injury prone. Yes. The problem, folks, if you think about it at home, hold out your left hand. It, you know, that's the hand that he has to frame pitches with. That's a difficult thing to do. It's also, if you feign a swing at home, your last really movement is to almost hyperextend that left arm every time you swing the bat. That's the thing that's troubling for me. 
So for now Kevin Plawecki re inherits the number one job which he had during Darno's last trip to the DL. And Plawecki has had his ups and downs and you know, he missed a week because of illness. He's uh, making his fourth start since then and, and uh, Terry Collins was asked tonight whether Plawecki is well enough at this point to play the vast majority of games and he says yeah he thinks he's completely over what was ailing him. He had a sinus condition that was causing dizziness and on Sunday he started he didn't uh, feel well that day either. Right. That was more of a stomach thing. Curveball knocked down by Luke Roy and it's two and two. So Johnny Manel is here as the backup and if you're wondering why not Anthony Recker. The reason is that when they first brought Manel here uh, earlier today they weren't 100 percent sure that they were putting Darnell on the disabled list. And Wrecker was not eligible to be activated because he hadn't been in the minors 10 days unless Darno went on the disabled list. Now that he's there, we'll see how they alter things. Pulled over the third base bag. That's a fair ball. Ramirez has no play, and Plawecki has an infield hit. Well, Ramirez at this age doesn't have a lot of range, and had to catch this purely to make the play. And it just got him. Right, almost in the wrist, not in the glove. Tough's got to get out of the way there. Hmm. So the Mets with a couple of hits here in the second. Two out and two on for Dilson Herrera. It's been a rough go for Dilson, all for his last 11. Mets down 1 0 in the second. And Herrera fouls back the fastball. Carrie, is that a little change that Herrera has uh, introduced today? Watch him right before the pitch comes. He rests the bat on his shoulder before getting it in position. I've never seen him do that before. Maybe making an adjustment. Coming back from the disabled list, he's hitting just 176 in 11 games. What that uh, is usually done by a hitting coach to a hitter is to get him to relax. You get the bat on your shoulders, so you take all the tension out of your hands and get ready right before the pitch comes. Slow yourself down yeah. a little bit. Now well, Fires needing it out gets ahead 0 and 2. The pitcher knees on deck. And Herrera goes down swinging on the high fastball. And the Mets have turned the side in the second. Three strikeouts for Fires. Go to the bottom of the second as you take a nice look at the boats on Lake Michigan. One nothing Milwaukee at Miller Park.
Holmes second inning. Hernan Perez leading off, playing second base tonight. Perez started the year as a T Detroit Tiger, claimed on waivers by the Brewers three weeks ago. And he hits a rocket to left field. Kadire over toward the corner, but he won't get there. Perez heads for second, and he's got himself a leadoff double. First extra base hit of the season for Hernan Perez. Well, he gets that cutter inside and was quick enough to put that in play. He was only two for 33 for the Tigers, now 11 for 35 here for the Milwaukee Brewers. Much better. His 68th at bat this season, his first extra base hit. Funny, the contact, his eyes aren't on the bat and the ball until after he hits it. Interesting. Maybe why he's not a 300 hitter. Mike Fires will look to sacrifice him over to third and let's see how the Mets handle this. They had difficulty handling a bunt with a runner at second with Tejada vacating too early during the trip to Atlanta. They've got to get to a point to see where Tejada is. Tejada gets very antsy at third base. So what happens is anytime the bunt is his way, he always comes and gets it. You got to wait. Sometimes the pitcher will make that play and you can get an easy out. Well, you talked about DeGrom being a great fielder. Nice may not be that caliber, but he's left handed, which makes that play even easier to get that ball to third base. And it's Tejada as the third baseman who is signaling to the infield how they want to play this. You can always sell out and play the, uh, the wheel. With the third baseman charging and the shortstop covering third, but the Mets never seem inclined to use that. The only issue with that is uh, Flores doesn't have enough foot speed to run that play. He tried to uh, do the pickoff, mm -hmm. but Nice didn't see it. Fires one sacrifice, one hit. Now they try the pickoff, and it nearly goes into center field. Flores wasn't really there. They really had no chance to get Perez, and Nice didn't make a good throw. Well, what happens for pitchers is that he had no chance to get him. And there are so many pitchers, Gary, that don't know that they do not have to throw the ball to second base. When he turns around, he can hold that. There's no reason to throw it. After eight close. years of the big leagues? Well, sometimes, I'm telling you, sometimes it happens. <laughs> if you put a play on, they feel like they've got to throw it. Bunted. That should be a play at third, but Nice doesn't have one and goes to first with it. Perez got a nice break off second base, and Nice took the sure out. One four on the sacrifice. Now this was run perfectly. Okay, when Jonathan gets to this ball, he got he has to make the decision. I think he had a play at third. I would have taken the play at third. He did not think so. So he turned and got the sure out. Not sure he got a perfect grip on the ball either. That's probably have, part of it. Might have had an impact on it. So now the infield comes in with Perez at third and one out. Gene Segura the batter. Segura grounded out to Tejada his first time up. One nothing Milwaukee second inning. And he takes a strike. Scooped out by Plawecki, making sure that ball stayed in front of him. That's an area where Plawecki really needs to clean things up a little. I think I, that was better right there. You, you got to you got to get the middle of your body. Around that ball, so it hits it right in the middle, so that way it bounces straight out. Rounded toward the hole. Duda with the diving stop holds the runner, and Herrera has to cover it first. The collision, he's out, and now Howard Herrera and Segura. Nice did not get over to cover, so Herrera, Johnny on the spot to go over and cover. They held the runner at third, but Herrera going right into the path of Segura, and they're both a little shaken. Well, there's nothing really either of them could do. Segura is trying to hustle to get there, and also Herrera too. They both had to really sell out to make that play, and Herrera did sell out, and it cost him the collision. And you know, even after the collision and being stunned, he had the presence of mind to turn and make sure that Perez wasn't breaking off third before he finally gave into the pain. And you notice that when he did get spun around and hit by Segura, you're right. Okay, he looks the runner back, but as he starts to get up, he almost stumbles again. But just a great hustle play by Herrera. And Jonathan Neese nice just got caught napping here. 
He didn't know what to do. He thought the play was going to be at home. Any ball to the right side, you always have to cover. Always. So it's a 3 4 put out. Terrific stop by Tuda to start the whole thing. There's a tough little kid. That was uh, quite a blow he took from Segura. So Herrera stays in, and we'll see whether Segura is well enough to stay in as well when the Brewers go back in the field. Now Jonathan Lucroy, the batter, with two out and a runner at third. You know what's oh. interesting about that play also is that Hernan Perez was starting, Hernan Perez was starting to inch down in case Herrera kind of fell down, and Ron Couple, the first base umpire, called, called an early timeout, which I think was a good move. I think as Herrera turned to look him back before he kind of fell on his face, as Tejada throws out Luke right to end the inning, I think they called the figure it's time to call off the yes. jam. Nice escape by the Mets in that second to keep it a 1 0 game. After the collision at first base with Dilson Herrera. Boy, again, what a play, what a collision that both guys are still in the game. It's a testament to both of them. I mean, Segura's shoulder right into Herrera's chest. And both come out unscathed. Jonathan East leads off of the Mets in the third, takes a strike for Mike Fires. John has five hits this year. A couple of RBIs. Quits himself quite nicely with the bat. Fires has struck out three already. We, we mentioned his high strikeout totals. Ten strikeouts per nine innings puts him fifth in the National League in strikeouts per inning pitch. Slice to third. And Ramirez throws out Nice one away. You could win a trip for four to Universal Orlando Resort where you experience the action and fun of two amazing theme parks. Plus, stay on site at Universal's Cabana Bay Beach Resort and go to sny.tv slash Toyota and enter the Toyota Fan Flyway Sweepstakes for your chance to win. So, Ronnie, I want to yeah. thank you for allowing me to take some vacation the last few days. Oh, I was, I was a, a wreck, Gary, for five days. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Um, Keith was fantastic, really helped me out. But um, uh, I know you're great at what you do. Now I really know how great you are at what you do. Well, I think that, you know, what you did took a lot of courage and, you know, to step into something you'd never done before. And what I would say is that you got better and better as the days went on. And I think that's the greatest testament. So maybe like 10 or 12 years from now, I might be able to get it halfway <laughs> decent. 
<laughs> well, I can tell you this. You know, I did before I, I got the job with the Mets. I did probably 500 minor league games. So, you know, it, it, it's it's the kind of job that requires a lot of repetition. <laughs> And uh, it's hard to, to jump right into the fire like this. So uh, I have all the admiration <laughs> in the world for him. And yet you're right about Keith. He is the greatest teammate in the world. He's the best. He, he was the best teammate when I was 25 years old. And again, now that I'm f almost 55 years old. But it was um, it was fun to do. The, the most difficult part, of course, is that you feel like the mush because uh, the Mets didn't win any games. I, the one thing I can guarantee you is that you had absolutely no impact on the outcome of the games. When you're down there, impact. But Up you here, feel like no it impact. a little bit, you know. So that you have to get away. From. That's right. <laughs> now you know what the biggest problem sitting in this seat as opposed to that seat is. Granderson, it's one deep to right. Broad gives it a look, and it's out of here. Into the second deck. A tremendous home run off the bat of Curtis Granderson. His 10th of the year to tie up the ball game. That was just crushed. And it's a 1-1 game. Well, this ballpark is the one, one of the ballparks where the ball just jumps out of here. But still, Curtis all over this fastball from Fires. Down and in. That is his happy area. And a long home run. You know, if you ever forget the kind of power that Curtis Granderson has, I think the one that he hit Saturday night in Atlanta, dead yeah. central, where nobody hits home runs, I think that reminded you, and this one was just, that was toast from the moment it left the bat. I, I think that he has just changed his mindset. Because earlier in the season we did a lot of talking about hitting away from the shift, hitting ball to left field, trying to use the whole field, and he still was only hitting at a 240 clip. So if you're going to hit at a 240 clip, do it by pulling the ball out of the ballpark. I mean, when he was with the Yankees, having 40 home run seasons, he was a 240, right. 250 hitter. One and one to Tejada, and he drives one deep down the left field line, hooking foul. Contact head down. He's got a little bit of an uppercut. That's what produces those home runs for Curtis. It's got to be a nice feeling when you know as soon as it leaves the bat, you know it's a home run. Tenth home run. Fires is allowed in 77 innings this year. Tejada fouled out to first his first time up. Not one year. When you hit around 240, you hit over 40 home runs. He also, hitting in the second slot, scored 136 or 139 runs, something like that. Seen number. Well, the Mets have done very little scoring on this road trip, but most of the scoring they've done has been on solo home runs due to hit one in Toronto, the only run the Mets scored there. They got home runs from Granderson and Garneau. Saturday night in Atlanta. They got shut out yesterday. Now Granderson homers for their first run of this game. Fourth strikeout for Fires as it gets Tejada for the second out. Well, he's got a split change that he throws. See that grip in the glove? Got the two fingers apart. And the ball just falls off the table to Tejada. Now it's Duda who grounded to short his first time up. That's short in quotation marks. He hit it to the right side and the shortstop threw him out. We still haven't figured out how we're going to score that. Well, none of, you know, none of the balls that Duda hits on the ground are actually hit to the places that it appears on your scorecard. Right. <laughs> and if he hits a ground ball to third, the third base is playing shortstop. That's right. So it's kind of a. Five slash six to three. Or sometimes the third baseman, like Uribe in one of the past series in Atlanta, he's playing in right field. I think we've discovered that's the backwards five. Oh, backwards three. Five, exactly. <laughs> it's gotten very confusing in this age of shifts. There's that curveball from Fires missing high two and one. Well, Lucas was getting on base with great regularity early in the season, but you see the numbers have tailed as the months have. Flipped so far this year. 
see if we see a 2 1 change up. That's what most pitchers have been featuring against Lucas when he gets ahead in the count. And of course, the problem is that he's been fishing for those change ups out of the strike zone. Whereas last year, it seemed as though he was taking more of those pitches and early this year as well. And so. Oh, what that pitch was 85 miles that was an a hour. Cutter right there. Yeah. Mike and I are on deck. And Duda hits one into the shift, but past the second baseman Perez, and he's got a base hit. Well, when you hit the ball that hard, it doesn't matter where they shift you, because there was no chance for Perez to make a play. One hop bullet to his right. I will defy your shift. <laughs> exactly. Put that on the growth chart. <laughs> so the Mets have their fourth hit. Duda at first with two down, and now Kadir who struck out his first time up. A little cutter right in the middle of the plate. I told Keith we need to get the growth chart, put it in our booth at home, and see how much we shrink over the years. <laughs> Just the opposite. <laughs> I'm afraid that hits a little close to home. <laughs> Broke it back grounder, and Segura makes the flip. To end the inning, but the Mets get even. One big swing of the bat from Curtis Granderson into the second deck. Well, up in the second deck. Tenth on the year for Granderson. It's a 1 1 game in Milwaukee going to the bottom of the third. In the top five in the National League in ground ball outs presented by DraftKings. Play daily fantasy baseball for free on DraftKings.com and a promo code NYM for free entry. Brian Braun had a base hit and scored a run in the first inning. Ron Gomez and Lynn, three, four, and five in the Milwaukee batting order in the third. And East misses low two and oh. So Mike Leak on that list of uh, pitchers who get a lot of ground balls. It's going to be interesting when Cincinnati comes in because they have so many players that people want, and it looks like they might trade some of them. Well, the Reds are only four games under 500. If they were in the National League East, they'd be right in the thick of the race. Right. But because they're in the Central, where you've got three good teams Cardinals, Pirates, Cubs they're 12 and a half back, they're six and a half out in the wild card, they may be ready to sell. 
Well, the, the first guy we'll see Friday night, who is the most interesting commodity, who I think is on the block, is Johnny Cueto. Yes. Now, Cueto was supposed to start tonight for the Reds in their game in Pittsburgh, but he was scratched. He's had a little elbow inflammation and pushed back a few days. There's ball four, and Braun is on for the second time. Second walk given up by Nice. Nice of all the starting pitchers. I'm talking about the five starting pitchers. It's the one guy that sometimes the walks will hurt him. It doesn't seem like any of the other starters ever walk anybody. And even Nice's numbers are not high. Yeah. He walked fewer than three per nine innings. That pitching staff has issued the fewest walks of any staff in the league. Carlos Gomez pulled the base hit through the hole his first time up. And he takes a fastball low. Suppose the price would be for a guy like Cueto. He's his free agent at the end of the year, right? Yeah. Boy, Low, second lowest ERA in the majors over the last five years behind Kershaw. And if it wasn't for Kershaw, of course, last year he would have been a Cy Young Award winner. Well, to center, but right at Lagares, and he picks off the line drive from his good friend Gomez. One out. Well, it, it, it would take some. The, the, the good part about Cueto is that if you Trade for him. You don't have to sign him. You right. know what I mean? You, you know, if you, you, so you say to the Reds, "Say, listen, we'll give you a couple of prospects, but we want, you know, you you don't. I don't think you have to give them the A prospects. You know, the I wonder though, best if, prospects. if you made the trade now as opposed to at the end of July, would it cost you that much more mm. because you're getting, you know, extra month and a month, maybe five weeks." Yeah, my my only issue with Cueto is that when you have a, a premier pitcher missing a couple of starts because of uh, some elbow stiffness, uh, I don't like that. And the thing around baseball is if anyone can hit, everyone's keeping their hitters. Well, you know, everybody who works for the Mets has been saying, "Well, the trade for Todd Frazier." <laughs> Todd oh. Frazier, do you know what you would have to deal to get Todd Frazier right now? And he's you might want to start with Harvey and Syndergaard and go from there. And Ramirez is the guy we've heard also, but he's an older player that can't play every day. That's, that's a whole different yeah. different level. Adam Lynn drove in the Milwaukee run with a base hit his first time up, and he hits a liner to short, and diving back into first is Braun. Two out. That's a good pitch by Jonathan Neese. Jammed Adam Lind. So two out. Braun still at first, and here's Ramirez who walked his first time up. Coming off a road trip where they had one of those home and home series with Kansas City and they got swept all four. They lost the two at home, went to Kansas City, lost the two there, and then lost two out of three in Colorado. Lifted to left and Kadire's there to grab it, so Nice works around the leadoff walk. On to the fourth we go, tied at one.
fourth inning. Mets and Brewers tied at one. Wilmer Flores leads off against Mike Fires. Flores single to left his first time up and takes the curve ball. For ball one. Well, that stood him up, didn't it? I also thought it was a strike, but not called by Larry Vanover. Well, you have said of Larry Vanover before that he is not a pitcher's best friend. It's uh, he's got the floating strike zone. So what I mean by that is if you're out there pitching you don't know where you can go to get a strike from him because sometimes you'll call it sometimes you won't. It's the rest of the umpires. Big Carapazza the Long Islander out of second base. Yeah, fires falls behind three and oh fires has not walked about it tonight. The average is about three and a half walks per nine innings and with the high strikeout totals that's why he tends to run such high pitch counts. And he walks Flores on four pitches to start the inning. Get a preview of Bartolo Colon's start in tomorrow's Mets Brewers game. Plus, all the latest New York sports news on Daily News Live, presented by City tomorrow at 5, only on SNY. So here's Lagares who lined out to center field. So he and Gomez have traded line drives. <laughs> To center field at each other. Two guys who have both won gold gloves. In fact, Gomez won it two years ago. Lagares won it last year. And they spent a lot of time together in the offseason. And they also share something else. They each have a partially torn ligament in their elbow. They've always been playing with it for a couple of years. It has seemed to affect Lagares's throwing more, though, than it has affected Gomez's. Of course, with Lagares, he started out with a stronger arm than Gomez. That's right. It's really an iffy proposition with with Juan. I mean, you know, the strong arm became so much a, a part of his Gold Glove portfolio, and now he's at a point where it's hard for him to even practice throwing That's because right. he can't let loose. So he's really between a rock and a hard place in terms of not having it blow out, but at the same time not having it be a detriment to the team. And not being able to strengthen it. I think the, the issue is that last year he gave his pitchers an extra out. So if they had a guy on second, they would not send him. So they have another chance to get out of the inning. I mean, we've already seen it tonight. The the play where the Brewers got their run. When Lagares picked up the ball in center field, Braun was maybe a step or two past third base, and in past years he would have rifled that ball home. And he wouldn't necessarily have gotten that's, the that's out, right. but he certainly would have given the Mets every chance to get an out of the plate. And here he wasn't even inclined to try. Well, number fires off the mound. It's spinning on him. He has to make a quick throw, and he got the out. As Flores takes second, it was not an easy play for the pitcher. I don't know if I've ever seen a pitcher circle a swinging bunt, but I think this is what Fires does here. As it stops, he's got a strong enough arm just to get Lagares at first. So the Mets have a runner at scoring position with one out. Now Kevin Pluecki had an infield hit right over the third base bag, his first time up. So let's see, Pluecki came off the bench. On Saturday and had an infield hit. And when Darno got hurt. He had the start on Friday, he went two for two, so he has hits in each of his last four at bats. Actually, he has hits in his last five at bats wow. if you go back to the first game in Toronto. He came off the bench and had an at bat there. So he's five for his last five. And he has few enough at bats that really jumps his average. Pushing that <laughs> thing up. He's up to two thirty three now. He would tell you he has a long way to go. That bounces just a few feet away from Luke Croy, but far enough for Flores to make it to third. So a wild pitch charged to Fires, and the Mets have a runner at third. Well, it's nice to see first that Luke Croy couldn't keep this ball in front of him and Karam's to his right. But also that the runner at second floor has had a big enough lead and anticipation that that ball in the dirt enabled to take the extra base. Now the Brewers will bring the infield in. 
with Flores a third and one out, two and zero to Plawecki. And Kevin hits one in the air to left field. That'll get the run in. Parra is under it. Flores tagging. Parra's got a great arm, but not good enough to get Flores, who scores the go-ahead run. Sacrifice fly for Plawecki, his 14th RBI, and the Mets get a run without a hit to go in front two to one. Walk, round out, wild pitch, sacrifice fly. Well, just perfect by Parra. He got the momentum going towards the plate. One hops it. And if it had been on the plate, it would have been a closer play than you think it should be from that deep in left field. I mean, that kind of depth, it's almost automatic yeah. the run's yeah. going to score. But he made it a, an interesting play. So Plawecki gets the run. He's still five for his last five. The Met record for consecutive hits is nine. I'll say Biscayino did it. John Olerud did it. Olerud, when he got his nine for nine, Reached base 15 straight times. You don't have to tell me he used to wear me out. He was a machine. What did he hit that one year? 350 something? 354. Oh, mockery of the game. That was in 1998. And then the next year, he walked 125 times. The only man in history who's ever walked 100 times in a season. He was unbelievable. And a Gold Glove caliber first baseman to boot. Herrera hits one deep to left field. Parra going back, but he's got room at the edge of the track to make the catch. And that retires the side. Mets go in front, though, on Plawecki's sack fly. 2 1 New York in the fourth. Home fourth inning, Gerardo Parra leads off for the Brewers against Jonathan Nice. He's a lot of first inning run. He's worked around leadoff base runners each of the last two innings. Parra grounded out with the bases loaded to end the first. It'll be seven, eight, and nine in the Brewers' order, and Nice gets the curveball over for a strike. Aaron on Perez on deck, and then the pitcher Mike Fires. Mets two runs, four hits. The Brewers one run, four hits. Little chopper. Herrera charging and a nice cross body throw for the first down. So Parra retired. Well, yesterday was an extraordinarily sad day for all of baseball, but particularly for those of us who knew Daryl Hamilton, who, you know, Ronnie, when people pass away, there's a tendency to always say nice things about them, to all say what a great person they were. Daryl Hamilton. Really was one of the best human beings that I have ever met in the game. I mean, he was a Met for a couple of years, and the guy who was always smiling, the guy who was 
intelligent, had a lot of different interests, uh, was a really good player. He was never a big star, but yeah. he was a really good player as Perez lifts one to center. And it just it just knocked me in the chest when I heard the news yesterday you know, that he it, passed away. It broke my heart too, Gary, because I not only did I face him when he was early in his career with Milwaukee and see his numbers when he was acquired by the Mets. But more importantly, I've recently worked a lot with him at the Major League Baseball Network, and I will tell you, incredibly intelligent man, a person you could talk about a lot of different subjects about, and uh, you got to witness uh, him have a couple good seasons for the Mets in 99 and 2000, right? I mean, he was very important to the Mets in their run to the postseason in 99, and, and uh, had a good series against the Braves and the LCS, but he also, you know, if it weren't for Daryl Hamilton, the Mets probably would not have been in the World Series in mm. 2000. That uh, that division series against the Giants, the Mets lost the first game. They blew a three-run lead in the ninth inning of Game Two, and he came up with two out and nobody out in the tenth, and hit a double against a very tough pitcher, Felix Rodriguez. Scored the go-ahead run on Jay Payton's head, and um, the Mets won that game too. If they lose that game, there's every chance they don't win that division series, and they never they never get to the World Series. But it, it, I I don't really have words to express just how sad. I am for the loss of Daryl. Of course, the circumstances make it even more horrible with the uh, 14 month old child yeah. left behind. And I don't think it's been talked about enough. Daryl also had two boys from his from his previous marriage who uh, who are in their teens yeah. and uh, and now will be without their dad. Uh, I just know that, you know, I did not know Daryl very well, but he was such a great guy to be around that my heart we had the day off here in Milwaukee just broken sad all day. He's hit by the comebacker, recovers, and unable to throw out fires. And now the concern for John Needs, who got drilled by that line drive. And just the fastball down in the strike zone and right back at him. Looks like it hit him in the back of the right knee. And almost made a great play on him. Yeah, he's pointing See, to that spot, yeah. just to the inside of that right knee. What happens for John? See how he's kind of facing backwards. You can see the back of his jersey. So that's why I hit him in the back of the knee. So Ray Ramirez and Terry Collins, Kevin Ploiecki, all trying to figure out just how severe this might be. You know, I, I was lucky enough, got hit many, many times, but um, never to knock me out of the game. And I just, if I felt all right, I. Throw a couple practice and let's go because you just didn't want to give the hitter, in this case the pitcher, the satisfaction of knowing that they might have hurt you a little bit. Well, John says it's good to go. See how he's facing backwards, so there's no way he can get his glove out in front of him. So Fires gets an infield hit out of it. And now Gene Segura, who was involved in that collision at first base with Dilson Herrera in the second inning after Duda made a terrific diving stop of his ground ball. Scooped out of the dirt by Plowecki. Well, we were talking about the passing of Daryl Hamilton. Of course, Daryl had maybe his best years playing here in Milwaukee. I mean, I said he was never a big star. He really was a star here with the Brewers. Well, you, a lifetime average of 291. I mean, Two out bunt try by Segura. That is not a good play. And they had a moment of silence here for for Daryl before the game tonight, yeah. as the Mets will have on on Friday. And um, it's just a, a man. Forget about the baseball piece. Yeah. A man who will be greatly missed just by a, everybody who ever knows. Just a, a class act all around. Well, Nice, after getting hit in the knee, now has gone behind 3 0 to the next hitter. And Segura takes a strike. Walk two tonight. The right knee is the knee that, that lands for John, so we'll keep an eye on that. Segura taking a Beltre like cut, going down to a knee. Nothing made me angrier as a pitcher than watching a hitter take a swing like that off me. Oh, that used to just irritate me. Because you, know, you feel like the guy's trying to 
hit one thousand feet and embarrass you. Well, he takes one the other way for a base hit. Fires will go to second and pull in there. So Segura has a two out hit. And now the Brewers have two on and two out. How would you know whether that knee is a factor for these? Well, I, I, I will see how he finishes his pitches because the key is do you want to get your back leg over your landing leg every single time. And if you have a little problem with that landing leg, you'll be a little tentative. He didn't look tentative at all, even though he got behind Segura. He faced Jonathan Lucroy, who twice has grounded out to Tejada at third. On the first inning, these retired the first two hitters, then gave up a couple of two out hits and could not get through it unscathed. Adam Lind picked up the two out RBI. Now he's in the same situation in the fourth, trying to protect a one run lead. We'll see that right knee as he picks it up and lands. Looks like he's not having any problem with so far, so there'll be no excuses as he gets over it. One thing we haven't seen is a lot of curveballs from. From Jonathan this, this evening. We saw the one early that Braun got for the base hit, and he stayed away from it since. Agreed. I think it's, a, it's it's one of his best pitches, and I've never understood why he doesn't use it more. Come on, Lucas! Luke Roy hits it toward right center. Back in the gap goes Granderson to get there, and that retires the side. So Nice gets around two out trouble, as we remember Daryl Hamilton. SNY's play ball program continues partnering with the New York Jets to help local youth football leagues with equipment donations, clinics, and Jets game experiences. Deadline for applications Friday, June 26. If you know a local youth football league in need, apply today at Facebook.com slash SNY. John Neese will lead off for the Mets in the fifth inning. That's with a two to one lead. Mario Vanover asking how his leg is doing. John said. Curtis making some friends. Always makes friends. Yep. You know, if I had to pick a guy who most reminds me of Daryl Hamilton, it would be Curtis Granderson. Oh, okay. Right? Another guy who's always smiling, very intelligent, you know, just has a good thing to say to everybody. Yeah. John Neese lines one the other way, and that'll go foul. Tuesday night baseball on SNY is brought to you by Verizon. Don't miss a moment of Mets baseball on the largest, most reliable 4G LTE network only from Verizon. The 
Grand spun around and it's 0 and 2. John grounded out his first time up. Granderson and Tejada to follow. That's two runs and four hits. The Brewers one run and six hits. The Brewers have stranded seven runners over the first four innings. And Fires sells one high. The numbers on Fires will tell you that he is most effective early and not as good as the game goes along. Bradley Perez. And Beast is retired one out. Fires' ERA from the fifth inning on this year is eight and a half. And you see what he's done after the second time through the batting order. He's about to start that third time through the order right now. So we'll see whether that holds tonight. Granderson crushed one into the second deck in right field his last time up. His second home run of the last three games and his tenth of the year. So that means what a three way tie now for the club leading home run. Yeah, 10 right. Duda has 10 Flores has 10 and now Granderson has 10. And he takes the curveball down. He's got a fastball right there down and in. Didn't even have to look at it. Nice try by the fan. <laughs> you know how an outfielder will sometimes give it a courtesy run. Ron gave it a courtesy look. Yeah. He didn't <laughs> didn't really run. The 2 0 change up that time for Fires. Now, if you're a pitcher, you give up a long home run. Yeah. Do you prefer that your outfielder give it a little run, or you rather he just stand there it, and just ignore it? Yeah, it never bothered me. I, I, I played with uh, Conseco, who barely ever saw the ball off the bat anyway. So. Um, it, it, it didn't bother me. If, if you give up that kind of long one, why should the, why should your outfield turn around? I know what you say, courtesy run. You don't want Conseco going back on the long <laughs> one right. because he might give them a home run off his noggin. That's right. <laughs> it's ball four, and Granderson's on with a walk. Second walk given up by Fires. That's one of the funniest things I've oh. ever seen in baseball. Well, it's the only time I've ever seen that happen. I forget who the center fielder was. He was a small guy, left handed thrower, left handed hitter. I said his name, you'd know it. But he couldn't stop laughing as, as he was asking Conseco if his head was all right. It would have been an out had he caught it. Yeah. Could have been a double if he missed it, but no, off his head and over the wall. I mean, Conseco is a guy who had an amazing career, did some things that no one had ever done before. 40, first 40 40 guy, right? Yeah, when you think about him, you think about the book, you think about the ball going off his head. But you know, the book, when it came out, he was ridiculed. That's right. For saying that, you know, the majority of players were on steroids, and it turned out he was, he was right. He was right. And the ball gets away on the pickoff try, and Granderson will go to second base. Well, Adam Lind, who has not been very good at first base, but this throw is wide by Fires. No need to even throw that. Curtis has what? Maybe a two step lead at first base? And he has not been running at all for steals this year, and most of those came early in the season. But it gives the Mets a runner in scoring position on the air by Fires. 1 0 Tejada, who's 0 for 2 today, fouled out and struck out. Throws a fastball by him one on one. Listen, the Brewers are 25 and 46. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> There's reasons for that, and it's little plays like that. A leadoff, uh, I mean, a walk to Granderson, a missed throw to first base, now a runner in scoring position. Exactly the opposite how Mr. Council played when he was a player. He was as buttoned up as you could get. Well, the Brewers have made the most errors of any team in the National League. Their pitching staff has the second worst ERA of any team in the National League, and they've scored the second fewest runs of any team in the National League. So that's pretty much a clean sweep. Bing, bang, boom. Well, they're right there with the Phillies for the worst record in baseball, a half game apart. Perez feels the grounder and throws out to Hada, two out. Granderson goes to third. 
Well, the Mets got a run without a hit in the fourth inning. I think they can figure out a way to do the same here in the fifth. It'll take a two out error or wild pitch or something of the like. Well, they got to get Lucas going. So great line drive in his first at bat. I'd like to see another one. Now this time they are not putting the shift on against him, and they're not playing the second baseman out of the outfield. Why oh. do you figure that? First pitch curveball has a lunging. I just don't understand sometimes these shifts. You know, with two outs, they shift differently. He's pitching him with curveballs, which means he's going to pull the ball more apt to. You'd want to be in the shift. I mean, last time Paris was 25 feet out of the outfield and due to scorched one by him. Here he's playing right on the outfield rim. It was interesting in Atlanta when Uribe was starting at third base in a couple of those games. Every time Duda came up, they'd have to tell him, hey, you have to go out there. And he seemed annoyed that he had to run all That's the way out there to right field. It's a long way for Juan to run at this point <laughs> in his career. Actually, the uh, the series in Atlanta may be the most entertaining thing the entire weekend. Watching 38 year old A.J. Przinsky leg out a trip. That's right. I called it the best two minutes in sports. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> Better than American Pharaoh. <laughs> That's right. I mean, he had a chance at a cycle in that game. He did, and he took a shot at it. Yeah, he missed by that much. He hit the home run his last time up. Fires out of the full windup with Granderson at third and two out. And the curveball bounces into Luke Croy, who smothers it. Three and two. Well, you'd have to say that. From fires the way he's pitching against Stude in this at bat. Highly unlikely likely he's going to throw a 3 2 fastball. Everybody's been throwing up change ups in this spot. We'll see whether fires is any different. And a fastball gets him looking. Would have thought it was low. And fusses with Larry Battle. Five strikeouts for fires. What do you think? Two one Mets halfway through. Home fifth inning Ryan Braun leads off against John Neese. Braun has been on base twice with a single and a walk and he scored the Brewers only run back in the first inning. 
Juan Gomez and Lind against Nice, who got hit in the knee in the last inning. Appears none the worse. So let's catalog tonight so far. Darno to the DL. Yes. Herrera in a collision at first. Nice hit in the knee. So far, one for three. Well, what's interesting before the games here, it's only one of the few ballparks <laughs> that, that does this. They announce the players that are on the disabled list for both teams. Mm -hmm. He did Milwaukee first. Three guys. Three guys. He did the Mets next, and it went on and <laughs> on and on and on. I was afraid it was going to bleed into the national anthem. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Unless you're a, unless you're a Mets fan. No, it's not. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I mean, they did it in alphabetical order. Yeah. And I'm thinking, it's not even close to David Wright yet. <laughs> and I think he missed a couple too. <laughs> they got Cesar Pueyo in there. <laughs> he did. He gets left off most of the lists. By the way, the other thing that happened with the Mets procedurally today is that Dylan G cleared waivers and was outrighted to Las Vegas. So Dylan is still Mets property, but he's now off the 40-man roster. The pitch in the minor leagues as insurance. Didn't but take, but, but I want to know. Didn't take long for him to lose his number. I was going to say if he makes his way back, are they going to get him his number back? Does Logan Perret have to give it up? Just rip it up, rip it out of the lock. I mean that that was that was cold. That was impolite. That's what that was. I mean, a guy has uh, been with you for six years. He's not even out of the organization yet. You give his number away. They give my number 12 away right away. Yeah, but you were traded. You were gone. Okay. They can hold it at least to the end. I don't. Of the year. I don't remember yeah. if they gave you. <laughs> maybe after you were traded the second time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> the other league. Three two to Braun, and it's on the outside corner, and Braun is caught looking. So another unhappy customer for Larry Vanover. That is the first strike out of the night for John Meese. Let's check in with Steve Gelbs. His report tonight is brought to you by Prism. Welcome back, Steve. Thank you very much. Welcome back to you as well, Gary. And listen, you guys were just talking about all the injuries. And with Darno on the DL, obviously it means a lot more playing time once again for Kevin Plowecki. And what we've seen from Kevin Plowecki this year is very similar to what we saw when Travis Darno first came up. There's so much on a young catcher's plate that sometimes the bat lags behind a little bit. And just to give you an indication of what these young catchers have to deal with, the Mets ask of their catchers before every series to look at tape of every single hitter on the opposition. A minute and a half from the right side in terms of right-handed pitchers, a minute and a half against left-handed pitchers. The catcher then has to write up a report, weaknesses, how you'd want to pitch him, why you want to pitch him that way. As that ball looks like it got Carlos Gomez, so he'll go to first base. But they write up a report generally that takes a, a bunch of hours to do. And then obviously it's about internalizing that and using it in the game in addition to learning your own pitching staff and, and the opposition's pitchers when you're trying to come up as a hitter. So it's understandable under those scenarios that this uh, hitting catching thing happens a little bit later on in the process. My question is. Why would you do that to a young catcher? Write a report? Right, really? I mean, that's why a lot of these kids left school. They didn't want to write any more reports. They want to play ball. And Boone takes a strike. Gomez hit in the foot by the pitch. Put and Ron, the, Ron. The time run aboard. Uh, sorry about that, Gary. And Ron, it is so different from anything they've ever done because, as Kevin Pulecki said, when he was in the minor leagues, it wasn't even a little bit of video, absolutely no video, yeah. all based on field. So well, I can understand the looking at video part, yeah. but the writing the book report part. That's yeah, I don't understand that. But you know. And Lind is out on three pitches, so Nice who went the first four innings without a strikeout has two of them here in the fifth. What you're trying to do for your younger players, and I'm talking about all your younger players, is you're trying to make it simpler when they come up here. Not overload them with a lot of information because you got enough good pitching here that they should know what they're doing. They should be able to dictate the at bats. Ramos Ramirez has walked and flied out tonight 0 for 1. What the best thing to do with the catcher is going to catch you? 
that week spend a lot of time with them have conversations go over the lineup over a cold one whatever it takes because that's what you want to have you want to have that great relationship when you're on the mound and it's helped if you have a friendship also right. how much time would you spend or would your catcher spend studying opposition hitters in a given start zero Gary Carter you didn't have to worry about him because he was like he knew every hitter in the, in the National League we didn't have in league then but with the other catchers really it was just a conversation you would sit down before the game and go hey this is how I want to get reins out so I'm going to try to get uh, Andre Dawson out he would go over the whole lineup and just kind of tell him what you were thinking and if he disagreed he'd go you know what he's uh, the last time when you pitched against him, remember you threw that first pitch curveball and he hit it for a base hit? Let's not do that tonight on him. Things like that you would have conversations about. It was great. One of the best parts of pitching. Ramirez down on strikes and knees strikes out three in the fifth inning. Change of fortune. Knees picks up his first three strikeouts of the night and leads two to one. Sixth inning, two to one, New York. Michael Kadir leads off against Mike Fires. Kadir 0 for two tonight and takes the curveball that misses for ball one. You see the arms open up of <laughs> Fires. He's like, where is that pitch? Every time I throw it, it's not called. Well, it's that amoeba shaped strike zone you were talking about. <laughs> Kadir, Flores, and Lagares for the Mets in the sixth. So uh, Michael Franco just did a three run home run. What a series he's had. First game at Yankee Stadium hits two home runs drives at five three run homer tonight Phillies are up six three in the fourth. Against CC Sabathia. A little uh, delay in the start of that game I think because of the threatening weather. Got a lot of trees down power outages in the tri-state area with all the. Strong thunderstorms that came through. Things are pleasant here in Milwaukee. The roof is open. Temperature in the upper 60s. Clear night. I was so happy yesterday. I, I brought a, a raincoat with me, which I very rarely do during the summers. And I'm glad I had it because I went for a long walk around Milwaukee and uh, it was pouring yesterday. Terry Collins said he went out to play golf. They got to the first tee and the skies opened up. He was done. That's the way that's the way his road trips go. That's right. 
those are starting pitchers brought to you by People's United Bank. One and two to Kadire. Now you were in Atlanta over the weekend yes. where it was 95 and humid every day. It was beautiful. Well, you know how I love the humid. You like it like like I like right. it. So it seemed as though the Mets starting pitchers were laboring a bit yeah. in the heat and humidity. Well, the Grom wasn't. The, no. Grom, the Grom was just beautifully he's, pitched. He's, he's a Florida kid. Yeah, exactly. He's used to that. And Kadire down on the high fastball. Second time he's been struck out tonight. And six for Byers. Let's check in with the studio. Doug Williams has a game break brought to you by Honda. Yeah, that's always the butt, isn't it? Stanton, it's a home run, but the Cardinals lead of the night. Yeah. <laughs> they are unbelievable, by the way. I mean, it doesn't matter who goes down for them. What stories are written about them? You know, how much turmoil there is. 21 games over 500. That's what you do in your championship team. You push to 20. You try to get to 20 by the All-Star break. You try to get to the 30 by the end of the year. That gets you 96 and 66. You know, I keep thinking that the Marlins are going to make a run and they're starting to get their pitching back. Yeah. And Latos is back. Justin Nicolino came off pitch really well. Jose Fernandez is on his way back. Stanton hits a home run every day, but they don't win. Yeah. No one else is hit. 11 games under 500. Shouldn't say that. D. Gordon has got over 100 hits already. It's shaping up as one of those Mets 1996 years for the Marlins, where they have a couple of players that have extraordinary years, but they don't win. I still think they're a threat. And, and the division has been so weak. That they're not yeah. so far out that they can't make a run. Well, when you looked at the division before the season started, you almost just penciled in the Nationals for 100 right. wins, right? Yep. And uh, you know, unless they get red hot at some point, uh, that's not going to be the case. So it brings everyone into play. That's some Braves are playing tonight. Washington's up one nothing in the third. They had a long rain delay there. Flores has been on base twice with a single and a walk. He scored a run. Long turn at bat here against Fires, and he takes a low one in, two and two. And there are the standings. That's just a half game in front of the Braves, who I think are the big surprise in the division this year. I think everybody had them penciled in for well below 500. Well, I was really impressed with them. The, the, we saw them twice in a matter of uh, 10 days or so about how they've changed their entire team to hitting with two strikes, hustling. Uh, their defense is outstanding. War is down on strikes. That's three in a row now for Fires, who has seven Ks for the night. Again, that split finger changeup. Bottom drops out. Wilmer swing, swinging over the top. I think the key for the Braves has become they need to get enough length from their starters to get them to the back end of their bullpen because what's in the middle there has just been dreadful. Yeah, they need to get to Avilan Massett in the seventh. Johnson's got to have won a, a, a break a comeback year and then really has been good enough at the end. Here's Ligaris who's lined to center and hit a comeback or 0 for 2. See the frustration on Juan's face and just another pitch he just missed. Swing looks much better though. When you have a team in the collective hitting slump, there are two factors at play, right? There's swinging at pitches out of the strike zone, yes. and then there's getting the pitch to hit and not and missing it, not getting yeah, not getting good contact, not putting it in play, or popping it up, or fouling it back, or 2-0 taking a fastball right down the middle. And it seems, just watching on TV, that the Mets have been victimized by both. Those pieces. 
And they've also, when they've hit the ball hard, it's been right at someone. Lagares in his first at bat. Well, the other day that that uh, double play rebase started, yeah. and mm -hmm. it looked like the Mets were poised to have a big inning. It looked like that was going to be first and third automatic off the bat. Let's see, these are the pitches here. Flores with the strikeout prior to this, and Lagares swinging. Those are the pitches you have to lay off of. It's not easy, but you have to. And that one tips off the bat and catches Luke Roy, who goes down in a heap. So it hits the bat of Ladaris and then Caroms oh Ooh. back into. And Luke Roy waving away the trainer. There's nothing that he can do to help him. He's got to wait for the pain to subside. Just uh, there's nothing to do. You just tell the trainer, just leave me alone. Give me a few seconds here. Try to catch your breath. Catches are tough. Up over 100 pitches for the night. His last start in Kansas City on Wednesday went five innings, gave up six runs, and threw 94 pitches. Trying to get through the sixth inning tonight. One of his better starts. And Lagares hits one softly. And Perez throws him out, fires pitches a 1 2 3 inning in the top of the sixth. 2 to 1 New York. Well, time now for the Verizon trivia question. Gary, your first day back, we're going to try to stump you. Name the first and last number one overall draft pick to play a game for the Mets. First and last number one overall draft pick. So not number one pick by the Mets, as uh, that's pulled foul by Parra. Overall. Number one overall pick. Yeah. Like Steven Strasburg or Bryce Harper, that kind of number one overall. That's right. That's a very interesting question. Which I have absolutely no earthly idea. Really? But, but I'll have to give it some thought. Okay. All right. Number one overall pick. You notice that? Jonathan Neese is going to start uh, that inning. Well, he did start the inning in the stretch. He had to change back to the windup. Maybe he's just trying to confuse Parham. No, he confused himself. <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing. I've done it too before. 
All right, number one overall picks who played for the Mets. Now, Straw was a number one overall. Pick. I guess he was. Was he the first or the last? I don't know. Who else was a number one overall pick? Um, that's it into right field. Base hit for Para. And the Brewers have had base runners in every inning. They've left eight runners over the first five, and they've got a leadoff base runner now in the sixth. Steve Chilcott never played for the Mets. No, but he was a number one pick. He was. Number one overall pick, right? Was Sean Abner number one overall? Oh, he might have been. I, th I, th I know he's number one pick for the Mets, but I don't know if he's yeah, number one overall. See that. I'm a little, a little short on this. And then there are number one picks for other teams. That might have played. Who could have played for the Mets. Uh, was Sean Dunstan a number one overall pick? Sean Dunstan, I thought, was picked number three by the Cubs. He's the same year as Dunn. Yeah. Who was number one that year? I thought Sean was. It might have been. It yeah, I, been. Think, I think he was. Okay. Because it was Jimmy Jones and Brian Elkers and um, Augie Schmidt. Augie. Those were the other guys drafted ahead of Doc. But I think Sean was the number one overall. So he's got a factor in there somewhere. Okay. Because he played for the Mets in '99. Straws last year with the Mets was well, his first year with the Mets would have been 83. Jeremy Jeffress up in the bullpen for the Brewers. And offhand. It's Jason Rogers on deck to pinch hit. Hand, I can't think of any other number one overall pick. So that those are going to be my guys. I'm going to okay. go with there's the runner goes and the throw by Plowecki bounces off the glove of Herrera and goes to the center field. Parra will stay at second base. The throw was on target, but Herrera unable to grab it and Parra's got his fifth stolen base. Well, nice release. It's a perfect pitch to throw because it's a high fastball and it's a good throw and just a miss by Herrera. He's got to make that play. That's a big stolen base there for Parra. That puts the tying run in scoring position with nobody out. A 3 0 count on the number eight hitter, Hernan Perez. So Nice has himself some trouble. And Perez what? takes a strike three and one. I'm going to go with Strawberry and Dunstan. Okay. That'll, that'll be my uh, Very good. That'll be my guess. Also, Robles getting up in the Mets bullpen as Nice closes in on 90 pitches for the night. And Perez takes low ball four, and the Brewers have the first two men out of the fifth. Third walk given up by Nice. Well, here's a Verizon answer stumping you, Gary. Named the first and last number one overall draft picks to play a game for the Mets. And the answer is, and the graphics we, went we down. We have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Maybe Dan knows. He can yell it up to us. Another, another injury. The graphics machine right. goes on the DL. Oh, and so it goes. Meeting at the mound, it's going to be uh, Hector Gomez to pinch hit for the Brewers. They had Jason Rogers on deck, but Gomez will come up to pinch hit here with the first two men on. I, would, I didn't get either one. Right. Okay. Tim Foley drafted number one in 68, and Chris Benson. I forgot about him. Wow. Played no 4 and 05. All right. I am well stumped tonight. Well, I, I, I could have helped you out because in 1981, the Seattle Mariners came to my house and said, we are going to make you the number one pick if you sign for this amount of money. My dad said to him, it's not enough. They said, okay, we're not going to draft you. But even if you had been drafted number one, Tim Foley predated That's you. Right. That's Hector right. Hector Gomez bunts foul. I did not remember that Tim Foley was the number That's one right. pick. Chris Benson, I, I did, but he completely slipped my mind. So there you go. All right, so you're stumped. We'll try next time. Now, you know, the uh, the Beat the Booth show is going to be on. Is that next week? I think, I think so, next right? Next week. So you'll see me stumped plenty. How <laughs> 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 we and me both. Gomez again trying to bunt and lays down a beauty. These may have no play, and the bases are loaded. Well, nobody reacted well to that. It was also a perfect bunt by Gomez. And now the Mets in a real tight fix. Base is loaded, nobody out. The Mets do just do not defense this properly. Uh, 
what you do as a third baseman if it is bunted away from the pitcher then what you, you have, either you have to stay on the bag or come you can't be in between and that's where Ruben's been for a lot of these plays he can't make up his mind this is one of those where he has to come and get it because it's just too far away from these. So Gene Segura bats takes a big cut at the first pitch cutter and fouls it back. Well, you also have to factor in your pitcher's been hitting the back of the knee. You got to think of all those kind of things before the ball is bunted. Uh, Nice's reactions weren't great. Of course, he's already had a play in this game where he didn't cover first base in a ground ball where he should have. Segura is one for three. And it's hit hard to foul just past Ed Cedar, the third base coach. Nice try by the bat boy. That was blister. And of course, Ronnie, and, and you guys, you Keith alluded to it all week on this trip. When you're scoring one, two runs a day, all these defensive mini breakdowns get magnified. They're giving you an out. You have to get an out. But you know, if you're scoring eight runs, yeah, but you can overlook that right. stuff. Yeah. But the Mets are working with such a small margin for error day by day with this limited offense. Infield a double play depth. They'll concede the tying run on a grounder, and it's popped up. Not very deep. Tagging at third is Para. Lagares makes the catch, and his throw is going to go toward third, and he's going to get it out there for the double play. So the run comes home. The game is tied. But Perez is thrown out by a mile at third base. It's an eight to five double play. Well, Lagares had just enough to get this one to third base and easily make the play on Perez. On Perez, I don't know what he was thinking. I think he thought Lagares was going to throw the ball home. Well, you have to watch where the ball's going. His head's down. He's not even looking at his third base coach. So it's a sacrifice fly for Segura. He drives in the tying run as Parra comes in to score, but Nice gets a couple of outs on some poor base running by Perez. Gomez now at second with two down, and Jonathan Lucroy the batter. And he takes a fastball away. Lucroy 0 for 3 tonight, grounded out twice and fly down. So the go ahead run now at second with two out. More and more just bad baseball gaffes on the bases. I mean, this should be second grade stuff. A lot of times when you're a player who doesn't play every day, you're trying to impress and push the envelope. When you do it, sometimes you get embarrassed. Well, if you make a bad play like that, could you at least slide and make it look good? Yeah, slide into his glove. You never know what can happen. I mean, it just seemed like he had no awareness that there was any chance Lagares was going to throw the ball third, which means he's not paying attention. I mean, he That's should right. know that Lagares isn't throwing well right now, and he's unlikely to throw the ball home. And Lagares really was going to throw that ball the second until he saw Perez, uh, Perez tag up. I think that's only the second outfield assist of the season for Lagares. Who two years ago had what 15 in about a half a season. That gets away from Plawecki, and that'll send Perez over to third. Or uh, go, excuse me, Gomez yeah. to third. Perez wanted to go to third. Yeah, but, that but didn't work Gomez. out so well. <laughs> well, there's one where Plawecki just appeared confused about how to how to handle that ball in the dirt. Just has to get down lower. He has to move his body closer. But look how he turns his glove here. The glove's got to be turned before that ball comes in there, and you've got to move up on the ball because that way you'll catch it on the short hop. It's easier to block. So now the go-ahead run a third with two out. Ryan Braun on deck. So a big pitch to make here for Nice against Lucroy, and the curveball hit down to third. Nice play by Tejada. It spins around and throws him out to end the inning. So Tejada handles the hot shot. Brewers tie the game on the sack fly by Segura. 2-2 going to the seventh.
on a beautiful night in Wisconsin. You know, they really cherish their summer here because their winter is so brutal. And they got the Rolling Stones in town tonight. Oh, forgot about that. Jeremy Jeffress, the hulking right hander, is in. He's a Southie. No, not really. He's from South Boston, Virginia. And the big right hander has pitched really well for them. He hadn't pitched since last Thursday, where he retired the two hitters he faced. Ronnie, I've been to both. And I can tell you that South Boston, Virginia is a long way from South Boston. It's a little different than Dorchester. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Ploiecki leads off for the Mets in the seventh inning. Ploiecki, five hits in his last five at bats, and an infield single in the second, drove in a run with a sacrifice fly in the fourth. Trying to keep the streak going against Jeffress. And he takes a fastball for a strike. Their bullpen's been pretty good for yeah. the Milwaukee Brewers. It's yeah. been one of the good points. Led by Francisco Rodriguez, who's having a tremendous season and is the subject of much trade conversation. I mean, somebody's going to want him, right? Ansel Robles still getting ready. Question, of course, is at what price? There's Will Smith, the lefty, up in the bullpen. In case it gets to Granderson, who's due up fourth in the inning. And it skips in the Ploiecki one and two. So Fires went six innings through 104 pitches, two runs, four hits, two walks, seven strikeouts, a wild pitch, and a home run. Giving way to the 27 year old Jeffress. He started out with Milwaukee, went to Kansas City and Toronto, back for a second tour with Milwaukee. Wilson Herrera on deck, then the pitcher spot. He's at 93 pitches through six innings, so we'll see whether he gets a turn. It may depend on what happens before him. Get the first two men on, leave him to bun. Yeah. Two out and nobody on. Maybe different. Siciliani has a bat, and Nice does not. So that may provide the answer right there. Although with a limited bench, sometimes you got to use your pitcher. That's of a four man bench these days. Broken bat, one hopper. And Segura takes his time and throws out Ploiecki, one out. Extraordinary moments happen every night in baseball, but on one night they all happen in one place. Don't miss the 86th All-Star Game. Coverage begins 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, if you happen to be watching in the Pacific time zone. And we thank you for your patronage if you are. Tuesday, July 14th on Fox. National League against the Kansas City Royals. Should be a good game. <laughs> that way. Well, you know, that's how the fans lost the vote in the first place. 1957, the Cincinnati fans stuffed the ballot box. Yeah. And the National League president, Ford Frick, had to step in and change the starting lineup. And the fans lost the vote oh, until 1970, 13 years later, when they started uh, with the punch cards. Well, maybe that's what you have to do. I know we live in a different world, and everybody wants to vote online. But maybe you only have the right to vote if you come to the ballpark. Or how about this? You know, they've got this system where you can vote 35 times. Yeah. How about with modern technology being what it is, you get to vote once. <laughs> I know they love shocking. They love trumpeting the huge vote totals. Yeah. But if everybody can vote 35 times, the huge vote totals don't mean anything anyway. Yeah. So limit each. You know, web address. Or, yeah. I, mean, I don't know how these things work, but you can do it so that each computer can only vote once. That's, right. That's it. That way you eliminate the ballot box stuff. At least I think you do. Well, I mean, or how about this? Do the fans have to vote? How about how about let the people in the game vote? I'm not voting for the people who are having an all-star season. Well, so that's, you can do that. That's part of the problem too. You know, we read these promos every night, as do the broadcasters of every other every, team. Vote for your guys. Well, it's not supposed to be vote for your guys. Right behind the plate, it says votebrewers.com. Right. It's supposed to be vote for the best player. Yeah. And people seem to have lost the the ethic of doing that. That's a shame. Line the other way, but right at the second baseman, Perez. For the second out. So two out and nobody on. And it will be Siciliani to pitch it for Nice. You 
know I always come down to with the All Star game the dichotomy between. You know this is a fun thing for the fans. Yeah of course. Or, and the game matters. Yeah. Well it's one or the other it's not it can't be both and they want to have it both ways and that's 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 very difficult to. Thread that needle. Another good effort by Jonathan. Well the only way he has a chance for a win. And he hasn't had a win in his last seven starts going on eight now would be for the Mets to score right now. Pitched well in the beginning of the year then went through a stretch where he struggled and looks like he's righted the ship. So silly I fooled on the curveball. Darrell has now struck out his last five at bats. Kind of coincides with them hitting the ball out of the ballpark, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yep. Yeah, hit that Pepsi porch home run at City Field, and he's been uh, swinging for the fences since. And that one might have gotten him in the foot, and that'll get him aboard. So the Mets have a two-out base run. Well, Gomez for the Brewers was hitting the foot, and so is Siciliani. It's funny he moved his back foot, but didn't move his front foot, which was. The one that got hit. And Greg, he's limping a little bit. Greg Council's on his way out to the mound. They've got the lefty Smith in the bullpen with Granderson coming up. So he'll make the pitching change here. So the Fresh Prince of Milwaukee will be coming on. <laughs> Jeffress exits. Smith coming in. 2 2 game in the seventh. Call to the bullpen brought to you by Verizon. We'll be right back to Milwaukee. Last year, 78 appearances tied Tony Watson for the most in the National League. However, Curtis Granderson has hit him well in limited opportunities. Two for four with a home run. He's got Siciliani at first and two out. Siciliani, a candidate to try and steal a base. Although he did limp down to first base, Siciliani after getting hit in the foot. Hopefully that has gone away. He was not even thinking about coming out of the game. Fastball knee high for a strike. Granderson tonight has homered and walked. Last three games now, Curtis is four for nine with two homers and three walks. We'll take that every three games. Oh, I'm sure you would. He'd you know, hit 100 home runs. Double clutch by Luke Croy and Siciliani steals the base. 
So Siciliani picked a good pitch to run on and Luke Roy double clutched. Well the ball's down. So see how he caught it in the end of the glove so he never did get a good grip on it and still throw it and Segura has got to do a better job of blocking that ball. You got to get in front of it and block it. If that goes into center field the runner can go to third. He's lucky it hit his foot. They called that a swing on Granderson so now it's an 0 2 count with the go ahead run at second and two out. And Curtis lays off that curveball. One and two. I was wondering whether, like after the inning's done, can you go to the player and say, "What were you thinking? Block the ball," or is that those days gone? It's very interesting you asked that because I happened to ask Terry Collins almost the identical question today. They, you know, talking about some of the yeah. mental mistakes his young infielders made on that on this road trip, I said, "How do you how do you approach that?" And he said, "Well, you talk to them. I don't think." Is not the volume that there might have been 20 or 30 years oh, ago. Man. Nice stop that time on Luke Roy sliding out. I'm not saying you do it all the time. I'm not. And, and you know, I know a lot of people say to so watch Luke Roy make that great stop. Is that you know, kids are different. They don't uh, you know they don't respond to that, that kind of verbal abuse. But occasionally it's all right to to do it because they'll they won't do it again. And Granderson chases the slider. And Smith gets his job done. Strikes out Granderson to get the Brewers through the top of the seventh. Still a 2 2 game. Studios in Manhattan to become the 2015 Kid Caster presented by New York's 529 College Savings Program. And we'd like to congratulate Dante Sasso on uh, becoming the 2015 oh. Kid Caster. Got to meet Keith yesterday, and he'll be with all three of us in the booth on Monday, August 31st. New York's 529 College Savings Program. We'd like to congratulate and thank all the contest participants and finalists. So we look forward to having Dante with us. What a cute kid. Good for him. So will he, uh, will he get the, the home run like Karen Galante and Jacob Resnick did? That was will crazy. He, will, he, will he have to bring a sandwich with him like Kyle Singh did? <laughs> He's got a big tradition to uphold. Hansel Robles in to pitch the home seventh inning. Throws a strike to Ryan Braun. I tell you, Hansel Robles is, is, I think, has an opportunity here because of his pure stuff to really be a factor for this club moving forward. Not only does you know he throw hard enough, but if he can ever perfect his slider, he can become a dominant 
dominant relief pitcher. Braun is one for two in a walk today. One thing we have not discussed so far today is the potential availability of Jay Reese Familia tonight. Coming off the groin strain that he suffered over the weekend. He strained it on the pitch prior to the, the strikeout where he threw a slider kind of limped off the field. Took the rest Saturday and Sunday off. Of course Monday the off day and asked today he said he's good to go and he's out there in the bullpen. John Gilmart next man up in the Mets bullpen. With the left hand hitting Adam Lynn two batters away. Well, you talk about Robles, Bobby Parnell's going to get up as well. You talk about Robles being able to grab a role in this bullpen. You know, the, the missing pieces in this bullpen are mostly still missing. They've gotten Parnell back. But, you know, Eric Goodell was moving into that spot as Braun takes the call third strike for the first time. Goodell was certainly moving into that, you know, that setup role until he hurt his elbow. Um, you know, guys like uh, Buddy Carlisle and Vic Black and um, Rafael Montero, they've all kind of disappeared off the radar screen. None of them seem to be getting better anytime fast. But the one guy who is, is on his way back is Henry Mejia. Yeah. Mejia just threw his first rehab assignment today down in Florida, so the clock has started to tick. He's eligible to come back in about two weeks. Yeah, July 7th. Yeah. So, well, it depends on rain outs well, or course, whatever. Sure. But, around that but right about two weeks from now, and I would have to think that if he is healthy and ready to go that he steps right into that eighth inning unless somebody else grabs it by the throat before that. Well we always talk about uh, lengthening the lineup so you have enough good hitters in there that your lineup is strong throughout it's the same with the bullpen. If you add a good arm that 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 brings Robles maybe down to the sixth maybe seventh inning. Um, it knocks guys down a little bit and elevates other guys who have been there before like Mejia. Well I think that everybody on this. Team and everybody in the Mets organization was incredibly disappointed with Henry. And. You know at the time when the suspension was first announced there was almost a feeling like hey we don't want him back. Well frankly yeah. this team needs him back. That's right. I mean I, there is a point where you're just angry at the player for making a silly mistake. Right. Um, but young people make silly mistakes. Old people make silly mistakes. I oh. still do. Gomez takes the walk. And so the Brewers have a one out base runner. Gomez returning to the lineup tonight. On base for the third time. And the question is is his hip and groin. Healthy enough for him to steal a base. We might find out soon. Yeah. First Terry Collins is going to come out bring in the left hander. So Sean Gilmartin will come in to face Adam Lynn. And then they'll have Parnell ready for Ramos Ramirez if need be. So the Mets making a pitching change in the seventh in a 2 2 game. Robles out, Gilmartin in. We'll be right back.
searching for the situational lefty, and unfortunately, the three lefties they have in their bullpen are all better against righties. Yeah, they get righties out, which uh, doesn't make uh, much sense. But Gil Martin's got a good breaking ball. He should be able to do that job. It's just that this is his first year. And of course, he was brought into the key situation on Friday night against the left handed Chase Peterson, and that did not go well. Peterson hit the two run double that beat the Mets and Jacob DeGrom that night. I think you agree with me on this, Gary, because I think we talked about it before. Blevins might have been one of the biggest injuries the Mets suffered uh, this season. Well, he was, he was perfect yeah. until he got hit by the line drive, and he has not even been cleared to start throwing yet. So Blevins is still well down the line in terms of his return. Adam Lynn takes a strike from Gilmart. Lynn tonight, an RBI single and three at bats. That came against John Neese in the first inning. Ramos Ramirez on deck. Bobby Parnell getting ready in the bullpen. Gomez at first, six steals this year, but he's been hurt. As it slashed right over the back, a fair ball going down the line. Gomez digging for third. It bounces away from Kadar, and Gomez will score the go ahead run. Three to two, Milwaukee. Kadire trying to play that ball cautiously off the sidewall, but it kicked out past him, and Gomez scores all the way from first. Well, first good hitting by Lind off the left-hander, but right through the five hole, Kadire was trying to make himself big enough to block that, and if he does block it, Gomez would not have scored. You can see him trying to break it down, and as soon as it goes between the legs of Kadire, he was able to turn it on and score the go-ahead run. They're going to score it. Scored a double, no RBI. The error on Kadire allowing the run to score. Now the Mets will intentionally walk Ramirez to pitch to Paris. So the Brewers, who led one nothing, trailed two to one, scored a run in the sixth to tie it, and now they lead three to two. And again, what we were talking about, lefty on lefty matchup does not work for the Mets bullpen. That is a very strangely angled sidewall down there. Yeah. And Kadire was playing it as cautiously as he possibly could and still was unable to come up with the carry. Well, here's the two box so you can see Gomez running. Now watch. As you see Kadire come over, he slows down and he makes his body as big as he can. But that ball just eluded him and went right between his legs. Another misplay late. It's become an epidemic for this club right now. And again, they're scoring so few runs that every defensive miscue becomes magnetized, uh, magnified. Sometimes when I've watched this team this last week, Gary, so Campbell play when he threw, when he tagged third instead of coming home, it's almost like this team is trying to play not to make a mistake. Instead of being overly aggressive, that's an excellent point, and I think that that was the probably the the example that really stood out. But same thing here. I mean, yeah. Dyer was playing that as cautiously as he possibly could, and it went right by. Him. So Mets now down by a run, and Herrero Parra will step in. With two on and one out. Parra single to right, stole the base, and scored the go ahead, the uh, tying run of the sixth inning. Oh. Gilmar gets the curveball in for a strike. Brewers now have nine hits in this game. They've left nine runners on base tonight. And the curve ball whacked to right, but right at Granderson. And he makes the grab for the second out. All right, time that curveball perfectly, but Granderson had him played perfectly. So now two out in the inning. Hernan Perez, the right hand batter, is coming up, and Terry Collins is going to bring Bobby Parnell into the game. We'll probably see Scooter Jeanette as a pinch hitter. So Parnell will come in to try and slam the door on the inning. A run home for the Brewers. Let's put them up three to two in the seventh. We'll be right back.
Bound trying for his 10th win. Our coverage begins at 7 o'clock tomorrow, right here on SNY. Bobby Parnell comes in to pitch for New York. When you watch Bobby throw, it's almost like you're watching him pitch himself back into shape here in the major leagues. Last pitch Friday night in Atlanta gave up a line drive out and an infield hit. He'll face Shane Peterson, the pinch hitter. Peterson batting for Hernan Perez with two on, two on. Brewers have gone in front three to two here in the seventh. And Peterson takes low ball one. We've seen a lot from Parnell in his last outing, throwing that kind of knuckle curve a lot more than his fastball. Lind at second, Ramirez at first, not much speed on the bases for the Brewers. And Peterson fouls back the fastball 90 miles an hour. And it's a little scary to yeah. see Parnell throw it in that 90 to 92 range. That is like perfect hitting speed for big league hitters. Especially since Bobby's never been a guy who has a lot of movement on his fastball. Yeah, it's pretty straight and true. Shouldn't call that a knuckle curveball. It's more of a spike curveball, is what the guys call it today. One finger yeah. curveball. When Jason Isringhausen has thrown for years and helped teach to Parnell. Threw that fastball by him at 93. One and two now to Peterson. That's the best fastball he's thrown since he's been up. That had some life on it. Peterson, a guy who's kicked around through several different organizations. He had a cup of coffee with Oakland a couple of years ago, but. His first extensive big league playing time, and he's off to a nice start for Milwaukee. Arnell ahead of him, one and two. And Peterson fouls it away. The one out walk by Hansel Robles to Carlos Gomez. Adam Lynn then doubled over the third base bag. And Gomez scored on the air by Kadire. Jason Rogers on deck to pinch hit for the pitcher. If Peterson keeps the inning going. Jonathan Broxton up in the Milwaukee bullpen. Arnell and Plawecki get together. One two. Stairs. Two and two. Lind at second, Ramirez at first with two down. Boy, a lot of shakes. Two out, two on, two and two to Peterson. Got him looking. Knees in black, Parnell strikes out Peterson for the third out. Brewers take the lead with a run in the bottom of the seventh. 3 2 Milwaukee going to the eighth.
They didn't have to bat for the pitcher, so Will Smith will stay in the ball game. There are your city probables for the two remaining games in this series. Bartolo Colon goes tomorrow against young Jimmy Nelson, and then or Jacob DeGrom, who continues to pitch brilliantly, will go against young Taylor Youngman, who is just starting his big league career. Taking Willie Peralta's spot in the rotation. Will Smith came in to strike out Curtis Granderson to end the seventh. Faces Ruben Tejada to start the eighth. Mets now down three to two. And a fastball catches the corner. Ruben tonight 0 for 3. Fouled out, struck out, grounded out. Lucas Duda on deck. That's why Smith is still in the game. Michael Kadire behind him. And another fastball in the corner, and it's 0 and 2. And you hear a lot of the bench jockeying from the Mets bench. Yelling to Larry Vanover, that's been a ball. That that was a ball, but he's been calling that pitch down all night long. And three pitches virtually in the same spot. Ruben took two of them and couldn't hit the third one. One out and nobody on. Let's check in with the studio. Doug Williams has another game break brought to you by Ford. Going for their fourth straight win tonight. Duda's one for three, singled back in the third. And takes a slider inside. A shift back on against the left hander. Wasn't on the last time up when Duda batted with a runner at third. Lucas 0 for 2 in his career against Will Smith. And takes a slider. But missed. 2 and 0. Oh. This is a, a time, Gary, where if you're a big hitter with big power like Lucas is, take a shot at him if you get a fastball. Well, Lucas has certainly done that in this ballpark. Four home runs and seven career games here at Miller Park. And if memory serves, didn't he hit a home run in the ninth inning to turn a game around here last year? Takes a fastball at the knees for a strike, and it's two and two. That's the ball that most of the hitters are thinking is not a strike. It might not be, but it's being called tonight. Most of the time. <laughs> Larry Van over the veteran home plate umpire. Two and two to Duda with Kadire on deck. And Lucas takes a fastball for strike two. Three fastballs after he got ahead 2 0, and he watched all three, and he'll sit down. You know, the 2 0 fastball was right down the middle that he took. These two, I don't th think you can even put those in play. So, three batters faced by Will Smith, and he struck out all three. Now, he'll face Kadire with two out and nobody on. Michael 0 for 3 with a couple of strikeouts tonight. Interesting call right with Broxton up in the bullpen. You got the left-hander against Kadire and you leave him in there. Maybe playing the hot hand with the three batters face, three strikeouts. It's been so good this year. Lefties and righties. Broxton at this point in his career, I think, is more of a flip of the coin. Mets have not had a hit since the third inning due to single with two out of the third. The last Met hit. They've had only four tonight. Become a pattern. They have four hits on Sunday. Kadire hits one right at the shortstop. And Segura throws him out. Smith throws a 1 2 3, top of the eighth. Middle of the eighth, 3 2 Milwaukee.
over 75 years of savings and service. By your Tri-State BMW centers. By DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the New York Mets. By Empire City Casinos, Manhattan's closest casino, your luck starts here. And by Hyundai. Hyundai invites you to get in your comfort zone with the most advanced Elantra yet. Visit your Hyundai dealer today. Jason Rogers pinch hitting against Bobby Parnell as we start at the bottom of the eighth. See Rogers numbers on the year. And K Rod is getting ready in the Milwaukee bullpen. You remember K Rod? Yes, I do. Well, I, I tell you, I thought when he left the Mets that he was close to being done. And he's had some fantastic years since then. He's a nine lives kind of guy. Well, he reinvented himself. You know, he can't throw as hard anymore. It's something that Bobby Parnell is going to have to work on also. Reinventing of not being able to throw 100 miles an hour. You know, what's interesting about that is that that transformation, I think, we witnessed while he was with the Mets. Yes. He started throwing more off speed pitches, more change ups. Right. Yeah. Now this is a big inning. If you're a relief pitcher point out, got to put up a zero here. Give your team any kind of chance. Gene Segura on deck. Rogers takes a strike on the corner. It's two and two. John Neese went six innings, allowed two runs and eight hits. Hansel Robles is on the hook in this game. He pitched a third of an inning, got charged with a run. It turned out to be an earned run, even though it scored on the Kadir error. John Gilmartin went a third and Parnell has gotten an out and now pitching the eighth as well. In the ninth, the Mets will have Flores, Lagares, and Ploiecki do up against Francisco Rodriguez. Lifted to right, and Granderson has an easy play. One out. Interesting, right? Though the, the Milwaukee Brewers just needed one pitcher to get an inning in the third, and Mets now have used three pitchers to get to an inning, inning in a third. Here's Segura, who's one for four today. His sacrifice fly drove in the tying run in the sixth. That's got a double play as Perez was thrown out at third by Lagares. Nonetheless. Segura got the tying run in, and then Brewers added a run in the seventh. Each of the last three games, the Mets have allowed the winning run to score in the sixth inning or later. This would be four in a row if the Mets don't rally. And in almost every case, there's been a defensive miscue or two along the way that have allowed those go ahead runs to score. Jonathan Lucroy on deck. Parnell behind 2 0 on Segura. And he chops one for Flores. Nice easy hop. Two out. It's a much better transfer there by Flores. So getting rid of that a little quicker. Well, that's really when you when you when you break it all down with Wilmer, that's really what it's all about. It is. He's yeah. got to learn how to transfer it quicker. Get it out of his glove. I mean, all the quickness stuff, whether it's, you know, getting up from a dive yeah. quickly, whether it's turning the double play quickly. He's just a big guy who, you know, quick is not really a natural thing for him. He's more of a, a deliberate player, not a quick twitch guy like your shortstop normally would be. You know, it, it's hard to tell sometimes on television, but, you know, he's as tall as I am. You know, every bit of six, three and a half, six, four. You know, when you see a shortstop that size, the guy you first, I think, yeah. first thing of Cal Rip. Of course. So, how did Cal do it? Well, Cal did uh, with intelligence. One, he knew every hitter in the league. He knew where to play. He knew uh, when to cheat in the hole if his pitcher was throwing a breaking ball. And the other thing he could do is when he would uh, take the ground ball in the hole, he could throw from his knees. He never did get up. He would get that ball in the hole and just have enough on his throws to get the out of first base. 
it was really revolutionary. I hadn't seen anyone throw from their knees as well as he did. That was a big player. How about Alex Rodriguez? He was another big shortstop. Uh, Alex was more uh, of a guy. He, I don't think he, he was smoother maybe than Cal, but I don't, I don't think anyone played the position because Cal not only, you know, was Cal a, a, a big player, a big bone too. Alex was a little smaller when he first came up. Strikeout for Parnell. He gets Luke Roy, so four up and four down for Parnell, and the Mets come up in the ninth down by a run. All right, all right, gentlemen. Now the Verizon Mets box score: Curtis Granderson homered to uh, tie up the game. Kevin Pulecki drove in a run with a sack fly in the fourth, where the Mets scored without a hit. They haven't had a hit since the third inning, and they'll go up in the ninth against the former Met Francisco Rodriguez. Wilmer Flores leads off and takes a fastball for a strike. Okay, Rod, 361 career saves. Next on the list, Jeff Reardon, who had 367. 13 for 13 this year. You see the numbers there. The walks are down. The hits are down. Lefties and righties both struggling against K Rod, who's having a magnificent year after an all star season last year. First batter face, though, batting over 300. But then he usually doesn't give up a hit after he gets a runner on base. You know, that's something that we always saw with K Rod that he would sometimes take a base runner to get himself in gear. Yeah. Three years for the Mets, 09 to 11. He was an All Star in 09 and did not get back to the All Star game until last year. I'll never forget in 2002 when he came up for the Angels and he just was unhittable. Pitched what, five games in the regular season? Yeah. And then was a star of that postseason, setting up Detroit Person. Right. One two to Flores. And it's on the inside corner. Down and looking. And Flores fussing with Larry Bano as he stalks away. That's 11 strikeouts for Brewers pitchers tonight. Back to sports night coming up after the post game. The NBA draft coming up on Thursday. And uh, discussion about emojis. Societal menace. It's a good call there, Chris. <laughs> See you after the post game. 
like the little emoji smile at the at the end. Keith has his own emoji in it. Does he really? Yes, it does. Does it have a mustache? Yes, it does. A very black mustache. Here's Juan Lagares with one out, and takes the curveball low and away. That's the one weapon that hasn't changed for K. Rod. He had that curveball yeah. from the day he got to the big leagues, and it's always been a prime weapon for him. And he always has called it a slider. He does not call it a curveball, but it breaks like a curveball. The difference this year has been in the use of his changeup, as you noted. As recently as his last year with the Mets, he threw his changeup 19% of the time. This year he's throwing it 43% yeah. of the time. That's a pitcher evolving. Lagaris 0 for 3 tonight. Kevin Pluecki on deck. Looking at a fastball, 1 and 2. Just keeps painting that corner, and the Mets keep taking it. And good framing by Luke Roy all night. One two coming and the guards wastes it. It's an interesting choice on Wilma Flores. He came inside with the fastball. It's a pitch you usually don't see in a one run game late. You make a mistake in there, you can have a tie ball game. Johnny Manel out on deck to pinch it for Plowecki. Manel just recalled today with Travis Darno going on the disabled disc with a sprained left elbow. <laughs> two and two to Lagares. It's in the dirt to change up from K Rod. Three and two. Well, the one thing that separates K Rod now from 10, 15 years ago is that he'd always get a fastball 3 2, but right now he can throw any one of his pitches on a 3 2 count. See what Luke Croy wants to throw. Fastball away. Back to the changeup. 3 2 coming. And he struck him out with the changeup. Two out. Back to back strikeouts for Rodriguez. Ball out of the strike zone. That has been a menace for the Mets lately. Well, now Johnny Manel will be the final hope for New York. Johnny just recalled today from Vegas for the third time this season. But quite a contrast for Johnny hitting 374 in Triple A this year, just one for 16 in the major leagues. Loves to hit the fastball, loves to swing first pitch. So the product of Christopher Columbus High School on the Bronx weighs in against Francisco Rodriguez. Two out and nobody on. And he gets a first pitch fastball away for ball one. Wilson Herrera would be next. That's last hit was a two out single by Lucas Duda in the third inning. That scored a run in the third on a Granderson home run. They got a run without a hit in the fourth, led two to one. But the Brewers with a run in the sixth and a run in the seventh. And Manel trying to hold up on the changeup, and he did. Two and oh. Hoping for a turn. K Rod has allowed only one home run this year in 25 innings. And Manel yelling at the changeup. Well, that's the difference between AAA and the big leagues, isn't it? It really is. You expect to get a fastball most of the time, you're not going to get it from this version of K Rod. Now he might throw a fastball now after he's got him to look at the changeup. Try to dart one outside. Luke Roy staying away. 
And Manel bounces one slowly. Jeanette comes in to grab it, and the ball game is over. The Brewers rally for a run in the sixth and a run in the seventh and hand the Mets their sixth consecutive loss. The Mets have scored just eight runs in six games on this road trip as they fall to the Brewers tonight, three to two. Well, under their new manager now, they are 19 and 28 under Craig Council. 14 for 14 now with saves and a 500 record for the first time since April 12th for this Mets team when they were three and three. Mets were two and three to start the year, ran off 11 straight wins and had been over 500 ever since until now, 36 and 36, as the Mets have dropped six straight games to begin this road trip with two more to play. So the Brewers, who started the day with an 11 and 24 home record, Get a victory in the first game of their homestand as the Mets' road misery continues. Mets are now 10 and 25.